Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Pascarella. I'm a landscape architect with a practice here in Rhode Island, and I have the privilege of um, moderating this workshop that includes our keynote speaker, Kofi Boone, whom you just heard, as well as Keith Stokes, who's a native of Newport. And this is a timely opportunity. This workshop is a timely opportunity to recognize the contributions by African Americans in the formation and the building of our country, its homes, its cities, its landscapes. Because of Rhode Island's history in the African slave trade, the first slave ship landed in Newport, Rhode Island in 1696. Many of our early landscapes and towns were built, literally built on the backs of African Americans. Our presenters in this session, as I mentioned, are Keith Stokes, a native of Newport, Rhode Island, and Kofi Boone, Professor of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at NC State University. And you can review both of their biographies in more detail on the conference website. Um, I hope you all were able to hear Kofi's uh, really wonderful keynote address, which challenged us to recognize the role of African Americans in shaping our national landscape and to continue to work to preserve sites significant to African American history but also to broaden the availability of our country to African Americans on an equal basis. So in this session, Keith will present several of Rhode Island's significant African American landscapes, after which I will moderate a conversation between Keith and Kofi, along with any questions that you as attendees can submit, and you can submit those questions via the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Keith Stokes. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, let me have a second to set this up. Thank you, Elena, and thank you, uh, State Historic Preservation Commission, for your fine work and this opportunity to present um, a very short introduction to why Black landscapes, and at least in Rhode Island, matter, and some of the great work that's being done in recovering and interpreting these landscapes all across the ocean state. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize in this presentation is, is that when we talk about African heritage or Black history, the starting point's not slavery or African enslavement. In fact, the starting point is Africa well before European colonization. This is important to recognize because well before European settlement and colonization on the African coast, Africa as a continent had a large number of civilized, organized, and technologically advanced peoples. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we as scholars of African heritage have been able to do is to work across the African diaspora and be able to reconstruct the very lives and culture of Africans who had eventually arrived in colonial Rhode Island. Most of the Africans that arrived in Rhode Island originated from what at the time was called the Gold Coast, or today Ghana, Northern Nigeria, Guinea, and Senegal. And by looking at primary and secondary documents, many of those Africans that would land here in the 17th and 18th century, many of them were directly related to the Akan and Ashanti and Fanti people of today's Ghana. So, in recognizing these Africans who arrived in the very difficult circumstance as chattel property and enslavement, we want to focus on their humanity. And in focusing on their humanity, we're beginning to call them and recognize them as forced immigrants. Because when we think in terms of an immigrant, an immigrant comes to a country not only as their physical self, but they bring their language, their culture, their religion, their food stuff. And so did these African men, women, and children. As they arrived in colonial Rhode Island, they not only brought their labor, they brought their culture, their language, their religion, and most importantly, much of that is still reflected nearly four centuries later in the very landscapes that exist across the ocean state in Rhode Island. I want to be able to also point out the fact that, oops, what did we do here? Here we go. I also want to point out the fact that uh, we're going to be talking about about four different case studies of actual landscapes and sites that have had some level of either recovery, documentation, and interpretation. But these are just the tip of the iceberg of dozens and dozens of locations that sit layered within 
other histories or forgotten histories that represent the early histories of Africans and later African Americans in Rhode Island. And again, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of historical institutions and be able to begin to recover and interpret places like Hardscrabble and Snowtown, early African heritage neighborhoods in Providence dating back to the late 18th and early 19th century. In Bristol, Rhode Island, New Gory along Wood Street that also had an African meeting house at one point during the early 19th century. In my own city of Newport, Negro Lane, which is today Pope Street, one of the earliest locations where Africans, not African Americans, but Africans own their properties and homes and several of those homes still stand today in the 21st century. And Fox Point neighborhood along the harbor and waterfront of Providence is one of the earliest neighborhoods of Providence, but most importantly, a neighborhood that began as an indigenous people, African heritage, and later a well-known Cape Verdean community. And Scallop Town, which will be one of the case studies that I discuss, is in East Greenwich along the waterfront in a late 19th and early 20th century African-American and mixed heritage community that existed as a small shanty town around the coastal harbor area. So the first case study that I'm gonna talk about today is Bellevue Avenue in Newport. Bellevue Avenue today is recognized as one of the most historic uh, avenues representing Gilded Age America. It actually is a part of not only a national registered site, but it also is the entryway to Newport's famed Gilded Age mansions. What few people realize is that Bellevue Avenue also is a place that has a large and significant African heritage history. In fact, during the Gilded Age, a time period that we recognize between about 1870 to 1920, at the peak of the Gilded Age, much of Bellevue Avenue and the adjoining neighborhoods were occupied by four African-American churches and dozens of African heritage businesses operated by men and women from Newport and those that re relocated to Newport from places like Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York. What's most important is, is that Newport, as it becomes a center of Gilded Age activity for the larger white community, also became the center of Gilded Age activity for the African-American community post the American Civil War. One of the things we've been able to do on Bellevue Avenue is the fact that the avenue is so much intact with many of the historic buildings from largely 19th and early 20th century, we've been able to go back into primary records and documents and be able to trace the owners, the operators, and the occupants of those buildings. And lo and behold, many of the buildings that exist on Bellevue Avenue, running from what is today K Street, the beginning of the avenue, and on across Memorial Boulevard to the entrance to the Gilded Aid Mansions, we find that a number of the buildings in the adjacent homes were occupied by African-American men and women. In fact, through the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society and private collections, we have reams of business cards of African heritage men and women operating businesses in the 19th and early 20th century. One of the interesting aspects of these businesses is that for African heritage men, many of them were fully vested in the what we today recognize as the hospitality industry, the service industry, and they were direct vendors and providers for the elite families who were summering in their summer cottages along the Ocean Drive and Avenue area. Many of these African heritage men who are operating these businesses from catering businesses, barber shops, vendor services, transport businesses, storage businesses, personal attire businesses, many of these men were not Newport born. In fact, many of them would bring their trades from places like Philadelphia, which at the time had one of the largest African-American communities in the Seventh Ward, the Lower East Side of New York, places in Connecticut, including Little Liberia and Bridgeport, which had a large African-American community, and in Boston, Beacon Hill, which had one of the earliest and largest free African-American communities. These men recognized that there were opportunities of economic and entrepreneurial investment by bringing their trades, particularly during the summer, along Bellevue Avenue in Newport. So what's important to recognize is that Bellevue Avenue becomes this landmark of Gilded Age America, but also has layered within it a very important story of African-American entrepreneurism, and most importantly, African-American ability to parlay that entrepreneurism into building wealth, which they in turn would invest in building early African-American civic, social, religious institutions. As I said earlier, there were four African-American churches in that direct area of Bellevue Avenue. Today, we call those neighborhoods the hill, the top of the hill neighborhoods. And most importantly, we've been able to pinpoint 
where African Americans owned and operated properties, owned and operated properties across these neighborhoods between 1865 and 1920. The second case study I'd like to talk about, which is, as I talked about earlier, was Scallop, Scallop Town in East Greenwich. Scallop Town is one of the fairly unknown African heritage communities of Rhode Island, but a very dynamic one that existed for a relatively short period of time, maybe a 30 to 40 year period. It was nestled along the waterfront of East Greenwich uh, today, which is recognized as a very prosperous, active center for retailing and restaurants and activities. But at the time, that waterfront after the American Civil War into the early 20th century was simply a place for shell fishing, commercial fishing. Many of the fishermen and women and families would live in shanty shacks along the waterfront in close proximity to a working waterfront in their job. And it included a significant number of African-American families, some who had been leaving the South and moving North uh, and relocating from after slavery, a Jim Crow South to opportunities and options in the North and others who had been living in other parts of New England whose trade was largely tied to the sea as fishermen and particularly shell fishing, shell fishermen, they would relocate to this area. The area by the early 20th century became literally a shanty village. Um, many of the people that lived there were living on a day-to-day -day basis, both black and white. They lived in these shanty villages. Their children had little access to education, other service support. And by 1902, Adelaide Maria Knight Hogman, who's known today as the daughter of the Fruit of the Loom Mill owner, Benjamin Brayton Knight in Rhode Island, she would start the St. Louis Cottage at Scallop Town. And this cottage was a place where she hired an African-American woman to begin providing access to education, training, and supportive services and social services. It literally became a major social service and support basis for over 30 years for that location for again, the mixed but largely African heritage community. By the 1920s, because of the urban decay, uh, because of the concern of the larger community, much of Scallop Town and the shanties were just deconstructed and taken down. And from that time, much of that history and the recognition of that history has been lost until this day. The next case study is Lippet Hill Providence. Lippet Hill Providence is one of the oldest and earliest African heritage and indigenous peoples communities in the east side of Providence adjacent to College Hill. What's important about recognizing Lippet Hill is the fact that Lippet Hill would become the most prominent African heritage community well into the early and mid 20th century. Many of the most important and earliest and active African heritage families and individuals of Rhode Island and certainly Providence had either lived or worked or worship within the Lippet Hill community. In the early 1960s, in Providence, like most major cities across the country, they would adopt urban redevelopment plans that would, the goal of removing urban blight and creating more open opportunities for housing, open space, and more sanitary conditions within neighborhoods, the Providence Redevelopment Agency had designated Lippet Hill, amongst other urban communities in Providence, as an area for urban redevelopment. This urban redevelopment activity for Lippet Hill would identify over 57 acres which was largely a residential community that would eventually make way for a shopping center and mixed income apartments. The challenge at that time was, is that the urban redevelopment pro programs going on across the country, which James Baldwin aptly named urban removal, removal should be more called Negro removal, were almost consistently targeting low-income communities, in many cases, low-income communities, which were historic African heritage enclaves. Lippet Hill, as an historic African heritage enclave was significantly impacted by urban redevelopment activities. In fact, out of the 57 acres, we know that at least a thousand families were dislocated at that time in the early 1960s from homes, places of business and worship that they had been a part of for many generations. And just to give you a sense of the impact of urban redevelopment on Lippet Hill, the image on the left is an aerial map from 1952 which you see a very densely compacted neighborhood largely comprised of multifamily residential properties. The image on the right in 1962 is when the, 15, the 57 acres were completely deconstructed and demolished. I can safely say that 20th century urban redevelopment did more to damage black landscapes across the country than any federal, state, municipal, public policy in the history of the United States. If you look at the image on the right of 1962, Lippet Hill looks like a wasteland. Every building, 
every person and blood, sweat, and tears that contributed to building those buildings, occupying those buildings, and having business in those buildings were wiped away in less than a year. And one of the great tragedies of the Lippitt Hill story is that nearly all of the families that were dislocated, families of color, never returned to live, work, or worship within that neighborhood. And that is a story that played out in urban redevelopment across the country during the 50s and the 1960s. One of the things that we've been able to do in working with primary and secondary data and working most importantly through oral histories of interviewing families who are part of that time is to begin the process of reconstructing that neighborhood. One of the things that we've been able to do is to put together a database of black owned businesses, black men and women and families who owned and operated businesses in the Lippitt Hill area before deconstruction or urban redevelopment. In our case, we've identified over 75 black owned operated businesses and we've set them up in business category, business ownership, and provided, and it's created an extraordinary opportunity for us to understand what life was like for an early black community in the mid 20th century before urban redevelopment. It also gives us a sense of, a lack of the amount of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurism that was going on at that time. Many of those were home-based businesses, many of those were service businesses that were directly targeted for people within the community and for, particularly for people of color. And as we've developed this database of black owned businesses in Lippitt Hill, it's given us now an opportunity to be able to retrace and reinterpret and document this history before the devastating effects of urban redevelopment. In our next case study, which is obviously one of my favorites here in Newport and one that I've worked on for many, many years is God's Little Laker. Uh, in Newport, we have today one of the earliest common burying grounds in American history. Our common burying ground in Newport dates back to about 1660. It was established as a deed of trust from at the time, uh, Reverend John Clark, one of the early settlers of Rhode Island and at Newport. And John Clark was specific in his requirements that he would deed this land as a common burying ground for the single purposes that anyone and everyone could be buried there. Now this is significant because at the colonial era, most places of, of burial were private or assigned to a place of worship. And if you were of limited income, and certainly if you were enslaved, the chances that you would have a proper burial in a burial marker and recognition were slim to none. So in Newport's case, at the very beginning of Newport, you have a common burying ground where many people of all classes or ethnicities and religions were able to be buried. As early as 1705, a two and a half acre section on the Northwest corner began to be identified as a Negro burying ground. By the middle of the 19th century, the African-American community would begin to call it God's Little Acre. Today, God's Little Acre section of the common burying ground is one of the oldest and largest existing African and then later African-American burying grounds in all of America. It's been preserved because it is a part of a larger white community burying ground. It was never separate and apart. It was integrated within the cemetery and by the very fact in nature and luck, that it was a part of a larger white cemetery, our African heritage portion was preserved. It's been a significant amount of work with a number of entities to preserve and interpret and restore and now celebrate this burying ground. This burying ground is a part of property owned by the city of Newport. There's been participation by the city's burying ground and cemetery commission, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, Newport Historical Society, and the Preservation Society of Newport County. I wanna emphasize this fact that there's been a great a number of partnerships of historical institutions who have taken the interest to be able to preserve, restore, and document this very important place. And as an historic black landscape, it's the documentation that's become very important to us because we have at least 300 existing markers, but behind each and every one of those markers, we've been able to bring scholars in and to work on through primary and secondary records to reconstruct the very lives of the men, women, and children who were buried in God's Little Acre. And now we have reams of documentation that gives us an opportunity to not only know what the life was like for that enslaved or free African in colonial Newport, but in other cases, we have documentation, including diaries and letters that traces these Africans back to their African origins. We have Africans that are buried in God's Little Acre who originated from the Gold Coast, in fact, it is so specific, they recognize themselves as a part of the Akan people tribe. They recognize themselves of living in Ananabo village. They recognize themselves passing from Cape Coast and Fort William Castle, slave castles 
on to Barbados, into Jamaica, and then eventually to Rhode Island. So this God's Little Echo burying ground, and with the documentation that we have in place and led by some great scholars, we now have that rare and important ability to reconstruct the lives of not chattel property, not enslaved, but African men, women, and children. And as you can see here, this is just one portion of a list of actual African, not African American, but African men, women, and children that once lived, worked, worshiped, and eventually died in Colonial Newport, many interred in God's Little Laker. And as a part of the work that we've been involved in, we've worked with scholars across the African diaspora, the University of West Indies in Jamaica, the Historical Society of Africa in Ghana, the University of Cape Coast, have all lent their work, their interest, their passion, and most importantly, their scholarship to help us reinterpret the story of this important black landscape. In fact, we had the opportunity in 2019 to travel to Ghana, to travel to Cape Coast Castle, Slave Castle, to Fort Williams Slave Castle, where many of the Rhode Island ships landed and were able to take soil and return that soil back to God's Laker to close the circle between those who once were thought were lost as they lost and were taken from their African soil and now can be returned symbolically by recognizing and celebrating their very lives and their very burials here at God's Laker. The other work that we're doing in this historic landscape, we're working with Brown University, is having graduate students developing an interactive map in a digitalized map of markers and with aerials and such. Because one of the things that we found in this burying ground, there are just 300 markers existing. They represent about 10% of the markers that should be there. We find that many of the markers have simply toppled over and have buried into the ground. So as we complete the process of restoring each of the existing markers, we will be moving towards ground penetrating radar and hopefully identifying, recovering, and then resetting and restoring markers that we believe still exist buried into ground under layers of earth over centuries within God's Laker. And as I said earlier, the most important thing that we do in restoring this very important black landscape is the actual restorative. We have been very fortunate to have investments from the National Trust, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, City of Newport, and private contributions. And we have some outstanding artists who come in and by hand restore each individual marker. For many of the 18th century markers of a slate material, the challenge is, is that slate's a very porous material. It doesn't break or crack, it just flakes away. So the challenge of restoring a slate marker that in many cases sit back to three and a half centuries takes very tedious, very demonstrated work of artists. And we've been very proud to work with Beyond the Gravestones from Connecticut in doing this work over the last several years. It's going to take us another few years to restore all the markers, but once they are all restored, it'll give us an opportunity to provide, open up the bearing ground for more, more tours and more public enjoyment. And I just wanna talk about an important part of recognizing and interpreting in a public engagement process, a black landscape such as God's Laker. As I've tried to explain, we've had the opportunity to work with scholars across the diaspora in helping us to interpret uh, and preserve this very important place. But it's the celebration, the recognition of this history that's become exciting. And most importantly, it's engaged a whole new audience within the general public. Uh, walking tours and virtual online tours are one aspect of access to God's Little Laker. But we've been able to work with artists. In fact, our restorative sign and interpretive sign was designed by a local artist by hand, an artist who builds and creates signage for colonial structures across the community. We brought in the Rhode Island Black Storytellers to come in and actually create interpretations of several of the African men and women in period costumes at the time that they lived to bring life to these men and women who once lived, worked, and worshiped in early Newport. We've been able to work with the Newport Art House and create art exhibits along the city of Newport that represent the very important people that live within God's Little Laker. And again, one of the most exciting opportunities and outcomes of this is is this year the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society is now working with the General Assembly and has legislation in place that will create an African heritage history curriculum for all K to 12 schools in the state of Rhode Island. One of the most comprehensive historical programs in the nation. Much of that content will be coming from the work within God's Little Laker in reconnecting Rhode Island across the African diaspora. And let me conclude with 
why this is all important and what the next steps with this would be. Uh, these four case studies and these several examples that I've given you of black landscapes across Rhode Island are a tip of the iceberg. The Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, through previous work and working with scholars today, has already identified over 100 sites across the state of Rhode Island that are directly related to African heritage, life, work, worship, and business going back over three and a half centuries. One of the projects that the Black Heritage Society will be doing in the upcoming summer into the fall is designing and developing an interactive map where particularly young people can go online and have a map of Rhode Island and click on a city, a state, a county, or a location, and then popping up will be videos, still images, and narratives about the African heritage men, women, and families who once lived and worked in that area. The map will eventually connect to an interactive map of West Indies, and then eventually to Ghana and Nigeria, so that any student can now see the African history and the African-American history of Rhode Island through the larger African diaspora. What's most important here is these efforts of interpretation, restoration, and preservation are just simply making black landscapes and history matter in Rhode Island and hopefully set up a precedent for the rest of the country. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share this information. I look forward to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, thank you, Keith. That that was very informative. As a native Rhode Islander, there's so much information there that that I didn't know. And and I, as I started this in uh, endeavor with um, both of you and Kofi, I I've started reading up more and more, and and I'm just discovering more and more about um, the con contribution of African Americans and how they help sh shape our country and our landscape. Um, I think I'd like to begin a question and answer session and commentary between uh, the attendees and Kofi and Keith. Um, and, and I'd like to start off the uh, the question with um, out to the attendees uh, to keep in mind um, if there are landscapes in your area that have significance for uh, with any African heritage, please let us know. Um, and then I also have another question regarding cemeteries and churches. Keith, you've done so much work on this. Um, when I worked on a project for the town of South Kingstown a couple of years ago on the Noyce family farm, we ran across a cemetery that's part of the, the Noyce family well kept, but there were tombstones outlying the cemetery that were kind of, a, you know, tumbled over. Do, is this very, very common to find? tombstones like that where um, maybe they weren't part of the family uh, and so they're outside the walled area? Yeah, Elena, you'll actually find it's relatively common across New England, particularly Southern New England, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island and Connecticut, to see where enslaved Africans and then certainly enslaved Africans and indigenous people working together in colonial farms and rural landscapes were part of larger family systems. And when they died, uh, they would be buried adjacent to, not normally within, but adjacent to uh, a white family or a private cemetery. So in Rhode Island's case, there are enslaved and indigenous markers to be found all across uh, what is today South County and before that Washington and Narragansett County. So Narragansett, Charlestown, North Kingston, um, you'll find that uh, all of these markers, um, normally two or three or sets of people who are part of a family system. And again, what makes Newport unique, uh, not better or worse, is the fact that Newport was an urban center. Newport had a large number of enslaved and free Africans. In fact, by 1755, about one third of the entire population of Newport were African, largely enslaved. I think only Charleston, South Carolina, and New York City would have had a higher percentage of enslaved to larger population at that time. So uh, by the fact that Newport's an urban center, there's more organized structures, there's more physical landscapes. And the other thing it's important to recognize in Newport is, is that by 1789, Africans in Newport had already formed a free African society nine years before. And in 1789, they form a formal burial society. In fact, they exchange letters with other African societies in Philadelphia, Boston, and Providence. And they actually have rules and regulations of burials. And so now you have a very formalized process where Africans in at least Newport and other communities are raising funds to ensure that every African uh, who dies in Newport would have a proper burial in a marker. 
Um, we just had a question pop up. Someone asked if we could put the slide of the Newport area, the map of Newport, back up on the screen. I hope you can do that. And while you're doing that, um, perhaps um, if we could answer some of the other questions in the Q&A, um, a question about, and this maybe open this up to Kofi, what contemporary black landscapes do you think we'll look back on in the future as being historically significant? Um, that's hard to say. Um, I think that there are some that are worth keeping an eye on. So uh, what among the many things I really appreciate and admire about Keith's work is uh, the term burial ground, uh, which even as a language is different than say a cemetery or something else. And I know one of my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Kennedy in New York City was the landscape architect for the African burial ground that's in Manhattan. And so um, as a part of construction, uncovering uh, essentially an archeological find of, of numerous uh, enslaved Africans uh, that were uh, were buried uh, in the middle of Manhattan. And so that now being enshrined in, a, in an historic site, I think that that will probably remain and be significant. Um, Walter's great work with the International African American History Museum in Charleston, I think also the sort of didactic approach that he's using to try and really use the story of, of African people uh, in the landscape, the way that he's arranging uh, elements there with the explicit purpose of creating these poetic moments uh, that help us connect to the value of that. I think that his work in that site will remain, but you know, the rest is to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to follow up on that, there was another question that during your keynote speech, um, some audience members noted connections between the black landscapes in the South and then places in Newport, um, the example being Duke University, which is uh, where, you know, in South Carolina, and then Rough Point in Newport, which was owned by the Duke family. So do you see any opportunities to document and interpret these landscapes, you know, similar types of landscapes together? Uh, I think the connectedness is, is fascinating. So, you know, what, what might that tell us uh, further about our, our African-American heritage in this country? You know, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, and Duke is in uh, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Durham. Not to diss South Carolina people, but uh, people get dicey about that down here. Um, yes, I think that, uh, uh, you know, part of Keith's presentation that I admire as well is invoking the diaspora and, and the fact that, you know, some of these boundaries that we put on places uh, are manufactured. We've made them up. Right. They're not tied to cultural ties or economic ties, political or social ties. And so I think it would be really progressive to start to use different ways of connecting places that would seem to be separate. Uh, you know, in Keith's presentation, he talked about, you know, going back to Ghana, a place I know well, um, and a kind culture and, and really cultural traditions and practices that predated enslavement. And I, I applaud and support his point of not starting the story at slavery. That's you know, for a lot of reasons, very limiting. Um, but I think it illustrates the persistence of some of those ideas as they came across the Atlantic, that they are still, you know, alive in many ways. But I th think that in terms of uh, recovering, say, the work of a of an able or another uh, person, I think that's really important work. And I think that in the, at least in, in the college and university uh, landscape conversations, that, that does happen. I think there actually is a Trumbauer kind of set of uh, networks that talk about clients and talk about projects, you know, in terms of their work. But to grow that up and put it in a cultural perspective, I think is, is a, an exciting opportunity. Yeah, you mentioned that connectedness of Trumbauer, and I almost see that, you know, similar to the way that we, we talk so much about Olmsted and the Olmsted brothers and the impact that they've had on the landscape in the United States. And, and I'm beginning to say that there's another connection there with Horace Trumbauer's work, Julian Apley, and and all the work that they have had done around the country. Um, there was another question um, relating to, are there any examples of communities that you feel have done a good job of counteracting the erasure of 
black communities, black landscapes, and uh, have brought more awareness and dignity to the generations of black residents who sh have shaped the landscape before urban renewal, highways, redlining, and gentrification. Um, I mean, that it, it's a great question. Um, it's interesting for me because um, going back to the comment with Doris Duke, I knew Mrs. Duke when I was a little boy in Newport. And last month, um, I did the docent training for the Newport Restoration Foundation that Mrs. Duke founded, and specifically to work with the docents to begin to help them understand a broader interpretation that's more inclusive of both um, the positive history and known history, but some of the hard history. Um, in doing that, in a community such as Newport, which dates back close to four centuries um, and has one of the largest collections of colonial existing structures in America, the challenge is, is that every building, every street, every landscape has layers of historical interpretation. Um, and one of the challenges that I've had being actively involved in most of the Newport's preservation efforts and in institutions is ensuring that we properly interpret the history, particularly African heritage history, but do it in a way that is sensitive to the very fragile nature of our landscapes and not to over commercialize through more signage uh, or more structures um, or more people in some cases. So one of the things that I think that we're looking to do is, is to take advantage of online and virtual programming tours so that it gives people an opportunity to have a very interactive experience of a site and place, but don't necessarily have to physically be at that site and place. Um, and it's a challenge quite candidly, because it's one that on one hand, you wanna celebrate these histories, you want to invite people, engage people to participate in these histories, but you're also trying to manage the very site. Uh, one of the things that we've done in Newport, which I think is important is, is that rather than having what is called a black history trail, we really have worked with each and all of the historic institutions and, and have them incorporate aspects of African heritage or African American heritage history within their programs. Uh, as an example, I'm chair of the education committee at Turrell Synagogue Foundation. Turrell Synagogue is the oldest existing synagogue in America. And I've been on the board for 25 years. We've created a whole series of walking tours on early Jewish history, but when we are engaging properties or sites or stories that include African-American, slave and free, then we incorporate that in the history. We talk about that. So I, I think what's important going forward is, is to not somehow try to play catch up by creating isolated or single standing black history programs or tours or interpretations. I think we need to just do a better job of incorporating a more inclusive history that recognizes and represents all of us, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, or arrival in the history of America. And, and I'm just very proud to work with a lot of young scholars and some really neat young people who are embracing technology and are doing things that I wouldn't have dreamed of 20 or 30 years ago as an old man today. A um, couple of other questions. I think we still have more time. Um, one question regarded, uh, regarding whether there's information on African burial sites in Providence and Bristol. Keith, if you know of anything, perhaps we can put a, um, a link to a website uh, and share that with everyone. Um, yeah, and do Kobe, do you there's the North Burial Ground is a very important site in Providence. Um, and then there are in Barrington, a site dedicated to enslaved and later free Africans, and then certainly in Bristol is a part of the DeWolf family. Mm -hmm. Kofi, what about nationally? Uh, or if you're focused down in, in the South and the Southwest. Um, are there dedicated sites? Uh, there are definitely cemeteries. There has not been a lot of work uh, with borough grounds uh, in my region. I am and it's probably worth referencing because he's sort of the godfather of this work is Everett Fly, uh, who's based in San Antonio, Texas, who's a landscape architect and an architect uh, who really pioneered a lot of the tools that we've used uh, to start to engage communities and, and document their landscapes. And he's probably most famous for his work in Eatonville, Florida, uh, which uh, uh, was one of the first uh, towns founded by, by free black folks in the United States. Uh, but also was prominent in the writings and life experience of Zora, Zora Neale Hurston, the great uh, Harlem Renaissance writer, um, and as a strategy to uh, build 
capacity and protect that town. Uh, developed a really innovative way of taking references from Zora Neale Hurston's writings and encoding them uh, in the zoning plan and in the legal documents, sort of defining and protecting the town of Eatonville. So using literary scenes as as a basis for policy. So it's still one of the few examples I can think of that did that and uh, tied to uh, uh, the Zora Neale Hurston Festival. And so uh, something I wanted to say to amplify uh, Keith's work, I agree that uh, rather than sort of compartmentalizing uh, the impacts of, of Black folks and African Americans in the landscape, it deserves to be connected and demonstrated as integral to our whole story, but that it's not just the place, it's the kinds of things that the place enables and connects to. Eatonville is interesting because that festival uh, features cultural rituals, practices, programming that's an economic engine and an awareness engine uh, that fuels and provides a revenue stream to continue the town's uh, policies and, and components. And so, you know, in my mind, it, it, it's one thing to start to document and 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 sort of uh, share information about places, but another step in some places has been how can living people, black people, uh, benefit economically, politically, and socially uh, through things that are enabled in that place. And, and Everett kind of set a template many years ago with how he approached Eatonville. And, so uh, in the South, in Texas, uh, you know, it's where Andrea Roberts is working at Texas A&M with, with, uh, with black towns and black settlements in Texas. And so, you know, it's sort of disparate. You kind of have to go from place to place. There isn't an aggregate uh, that I can think of that, that, that compiles all of this work on, on, on burial grounds. We have a few more questions. I'm hoping we can take, uh, take the rest of them. Um, Jeff Emity pointed out uh, from a, uh, one of the attendees um, the role of Frederick C. Williamson, who was Rhode Island's first uh, state historic preservation officer and the nation's first African-American state pres historic preservation officer, and at one point the country's longest serving state historic preservation officer. So I just wanted to mention that. I know he played an important role, and Keith, Keith I'm sure you you coordinated a lot with him. Uh, Elena, uh, the late Fred Williamson was my mentor. Um, he, along with my mom, Rowena Stewart, the late Mike Van Leesten, were all the founders of what became the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society in 1976. And uh, Fred, I, I'm here today because of Fred Williamson. I mean, to have a strong black man when I was a kid in high school, uh, put me in internships with the Rhode Island Historical Society and the Board Historical Society. When mm -hmm. I was in college, uh, he's director of community affairs for the state of Rhode Island, historic preservation officer, and calling me and saying, Keith, I'm giving you summer internships to work at the Black Heritage Society. You're going to do this. And then as a young man, it's Fred Williamson that introduced me to the National Trust and has me become a Rhode Island advisor to the National Trust. Um, Fred Williamson is a champion of historic preservation for the state of Rhode Island, but he is a champion and a mentor to many young black men and women like myself in Rhode Island, countless people that kept us engaged in this state, proud of being in the state, uh, and succeed in this state. So I, I can't think of a more important contributor to historic preservation in the state of Rhode Island than Frederick Williamson. Um, he's that type of man, and I was proud to know him. I, I remember him very well. He was, he was a real wonderful person, great knowledge, and, and just a wonderful gentleman. Um, a question from Pierre Mornon uh, about if you probably geared, geared towards Keith, if you could comment on the intersection between the Narragansett tribe, African Americans, and the Cape Verdean landscapes. And that's, that's a great question. Opening up a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, I, I think succinctly, when you think of the histories of the indigenous people in Rhode Island, the African heritage people, um, you go back to the very settlement of Rhode Island. Uh, the very settlement of Rhode Island uh, was based upon the acquisition of native land and the use of enslaved African labor. And in fact, uh, the very prosperity of Rhode Island and New England and America mm -hmm. is based upon native land and African labor, uh, both obtained largely at no cost. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting about the intersections between native people and African heritage people in New England generally is the fact that by the end of the 17th century with a combination of disease and war, uh, the Pequot War and the King Philip's War, uh, 
much of the indigenous people were wiped out. The few remaining were sold off enslaved to the West Indies. So by the late early 18th century, what we call today in the black community creative survival, you now have many interrelationships and intermarriages between natives and Africans. And in fact, uh, when you look at the Wampanoags of the Southeast of Massachusetts, Narragansetts, here in Rhode Island, Pequots, Mohegans, Connecticut, many of them, not all, but many of them have African heritage and ancestry. And that dates back to the 17th and 18th century creative survival of both populations. So the intersections are deep, in particularly in the southern rural areas of Rhode Island, where enslaved Africans and indentured natives work side by side, live side by side. And to this very day, some of the oldest African American families of Rhode Island and New England have names such as Walmsley and Whedon, um, Brown, all go back to a shared white, black, and native ancestry. And it's, it's an incredible history and an important history. And many of the landscapes in Rhode Island are directly tied to those people in their creative survival. Uh, I would love to see a group of scholars come forward and develop an interpretation and program on that blended history. Uh, it would be exciting, it would be new information, and it would be dynamic information to share to all. Um, we have a couple of minutes uh, left, and I think I'd like to ask the question uh, from Courtney Good. Um, how do you propose honoring the history of enslaved persons when restoring and redesigning parts of historic homes? grounds and cemeteries that have been owned and named after prominent colonial slave owners. You know, we, we touch upon this with, you know, some of the key places, Monticello and Mount Vernon are two that come to mind. I mean, I, I can give you my viewpoint. I mean, having an enslaved ancestor that originated in Ananabo to Jamaica, to eventually Rhode Island and having their artifacts and records, it's something I've always recognized. But I also recognize the fact that slavery is not black history. Black history is how our African heritage ancestors survived and thrived despite enslavement. So my focus has always been on the stories of the people. Um, I have little interest in interpreting the stories of John Brown or James DeWolf or uh, any of the slave owners and slave traders because they did what they did because they were able to do it. Uh, I'm more interested in the African heritage men, women, and children that survived it and thrived. And in Rhode Island, we're one of the few places in the country that has deep and diverse primary secondary records that give us an opportunity to be able to reinterpret the history and the stories of these African and later African American people, be it through their landscapes, be it through their lives, their work, and many of the artifacts that still exist. So what I'm hearing from particularly young kids of color they're less interested in slave owners and slave masters and more interested in people like Bristol Yama and John Camino, who were the first two Africans to attend college in 1774 from Rhode Island. Duchess Camino, an African-American woman entrepreneur. I can go through the list on and on and on. So I think the challenge today and going forward is, is how do we interpret the history accurately, but more importantly, in a compelling manner that provides identity, pride, and interest to a whole new audience of largely people of color and young people of color who want to learn about their history and their place of history in Newport or Providence or Rhode Island or across the Americas. I think we have about a half a minute left. Kofi, if you can jump in and just give your thoughts on that. <laughs> Keith said it. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, I teach landscape architecture and, and design, and uh, we have a, a, a a habit of trying to use whatever we're doing as sort of a, a way to uh, give justification for design and changing form. And I think what Keith laid out is probably another way to go. I don't have a one size fits all approach for those things. And I think with more time we could talk about particularly opportunities in public spaces where that's possible. But but I think there is a lot that we can do with information, with education and the perception and sort of grounding those other perspectives, uh, allowing people to have a lens that when they view these things, that they're seeing it with a, a fresh set of eyes. And so in some cases that may not require uh, a intensive infrastructure that's built, but there's more of the infrastructure in our, in our heads, our education infrastructure, our awareness infrastructure. So there's a longer winded answer, but that's the, that's the 30, 30 second version. 
Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I was, this is really a wonderful presentation. It's certainly, uh, as a, a landscape architect who works with historic landscapes, this has opened up a whole new realm and a whole new area for me to explore um, as I continue my work. And I hope everyone else has, has gained a lot from this presentation. Thank you.